God has something special for all of us this morning. How many are ready to receive what God has for us? Amen. Well, let us have a moment of prayer. Father, your love is amazing. Your love is great. Your love is pure for us and unconditional. And you have extended that love, Father God, in our lives and your grace and your mercy, Lord, that you have given us such a great day today. This is the day that you have prepared for us. And Father, we are ready. We're ready to worship you. We're ready to give, to give you our hearts, our minds, our souls. We're ready to be challenged we're ready, Lord, to, to surrender to you, Father. We thank you for the opportunity you have given us this morning to wake up and open our eyes and be present. Father, receive our praises, Lord. We ask that your blessing may pour down on us. May you give us the strength. May you give us health. Father, may we feel your presence this morning, not only as we sing and as we read the scripture, but also as we share with one another in unity, Lord. As we worship you, may we feel your presence in this place. Father, only you know each and every one of our lives individually. Only you know each and every one of our needs and only you, Lord, can supply those needs. Lord, we're here to give you the best of us. And you receive that, God. So, Father God, I pray that as our hearts open up to you, may your Holy Spirit comes in and fills us up. May we have a great experience with you this morning. May this experience of today encourage us, Lord, to also speak of your love to everyone around us. May we be able to share this love and share, Father God, your grace to everyone that surrounds us. May this experience, Father God, be an opportunity for us to speak to one person about you, Jesus, and bring one more to you, Jesus. Father, this is a time for you and us to connect together. And you know that many times there are things in our minds and in our heart that may prevent from us to connect with you today. So Holy Spirit, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you remove anything from our minds and from our heart that may prevent from us to connect with the Father to connect with you. And please help us to connect together with our Father so that we receive our blessings for today. I pray this in Jesus' name and thank you, God. Amen. While we are waiting, God is waiting with us. God's promises are both now and yet to come. Wait and see. Please stand as you are able. Please join me in the call to worship. We wait with hope. For God's promises are sure. We wait with patience. For God's times is a mystery. Come and worship. We will wait upon the Lord together.
please join me in the unison prayer? Patient, loving God, when we are groaning and griping, comfort us and forgive our shortcomings. When we are doubting and afraid, comfort us and reveal your promises to us. Help us trust with hope and wait with patience, even as you patiently love us with your mercy and your grace. In your loving name, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The lesson this morning is from Romans chapter 8, verses 10 through 17. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by his same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit, you put death to the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are God, his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. The word of the Lord. Praise be to you, Christ. Strong. 
Amen. Well, we got to uh, the point uh, today of our uh, message, the Word of God, and we continue in our sermon series called uh, Agape Love. We are talking about God's love. Agape, it's God's love, and um, we have a first sermon, uh, the first Sunday of this month. And in, in, in we explain a little bit of uh, when the, the Bible talks about love, there are many words in the Greek uh, word that it is translated to love. And although we only know one word of love, in the Greek language, there's many uh, different loves, uh, uh, word. For example, the love to a, a, a brother or a, a friend, a friendship love, the Greek word for that, that love is uh, philos, philios, and that's why in, Pen in Philadelphia, it's known as the uh, brotherly love, the city of brotherly love, because philo comes from that Greek word love. And so on, the arrows is for the marital love. And so we come to the love of God, which is different, and we are talking about the uh, agape love. And agape love. And that's what we explained last week, uh, two weeks ago, our first sermon. And today, the sermon title is Loved as Jesus. God's love for us is equal to the love that he has for his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to explain today. Let me explain this a little further through the Gospel of John chapter 17, and we're going to read verses 25 and 26. O righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. Now, these words was Jesus praying to the Father. It was a prayer that is found in, in the whole chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. Jesus is praying for his disciples, he's, he's praying for us as well. So, and in this last part, these are the last verses in which Jesus is praying and saying, Father, that they know you because I have revealed to them and I will continue to do so. So the love that you have for me will be in them and I will be in them. William Dixon was a widower who had also lost a son, his son, and he lived in England. One day he saw that the house next to him, one of his neighbor's house was on fire. And although the aged owner was rescued, her orphan grandson was trapped in the blaze. Mr. Dixon, without thinking about it, climbed an iron pipe on the side of the house and lowered the boy to safety. His hand that held on the pipe was badly burned. Surely uh, after the fire, the grandmother died. And now the boy stayed with no parents, no grandparents, no family. So the townspeople wonder who will care for this little boy. 
They now have no family. Two volunteers appear before the town council, and one was a father who also had lost his son and wanted to adopt the orphan child as his own. Then the other one was Mr. Dixon. But instead of speaking the reason why he should be caring for this boy, the only thing that Mr. Dixon did was to show his hand that was badly burned. When the time for the vote came, the town people selected Mr. Dixon for his bravery and because he showed the love that he had for this boy, Mr. Dixon was able to adopt the child. This story is, I bring you this story so it can further explain the love of God for each and every one of us. God's love is an active, tangible, and action-oriented love. It is not just a love that it was written in pages. It's a love that we can even see and experience in our own life. The love of God is different than the love that we experience with one another. Because we can see the love of God in action. His love is a choice. His love is a choice that he made thousands of years ago. And this is the love that Jesus Christ had for us, that he put his life for each and every one of us, individually thinking of us. God's love is not a feeling. You understand that? God's love is not, it's, it's a choice and it's not a feeling. We have a feeling in our heart for the love of someone. Whether it's a friend or whether it's a, a, a daughter or a son, a, a spouse, we feel love. But God's love is not a feeling. God's love is a joy. And why God's love is not a feeling? Because uh, the, the, when we feel love, feelings can change depending on their circumstances. If God would have a feeling love, if God would be feeling love, it means that there will be something that we will do that could change that love for us. But God's love doesn't change. God's love remains the same for us. Why? Because he loves us the same way he loves his son, Jesus Christ, the one that gave his life to give us eternal life. Do you realize that? Is there any greater love than the one that was displaced on the cross? Can you, can you think about any greater love than that one? They have an action before you even knew God. Jesus Christ said, I love you and I will die for you. How can you explain such a love? How can you explain agape love? It is very impossible for us to try to explain God's love. And we are all familiar with the Lord's prayers. In fact, we're about to pray that Lord's prayer later on in the program. And we're all familiar with the Lord's prayer that is found in Matthews and, and, and it's found also in the Gospel of Luke. When the disciples saw Jesus praying, the disciple asked Jesus, can you teach us how to pray? And Jesus started to tell them, when you pray, go into the, don't do like the Pharisees, don't do like these people, that they only want it for people to see them. You just go to your own room and close the door. And when you pray, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be that. We're familiar with that, right? And how powerful that prayer is. That every Sunday, that every day we come to, to the presence of God and, and, and we pray this prayer. Because Jesus Christ taught us how to pray. But what if I tell you that that's not the most powerful prayer in the scripture? What if I tell you that there is a prayer that is way more powerful than the one that Jesus taught us how to pray? 
This prayer is the one found in, in the Gospel of John. And John revealed the time Jesus was interceding, not just for the disciple in his ministry. Jesus was thinking about you and me. Jesus was thinking, in, in, in Jesus' mind, you were there when he was praying to the Father. And if we go to John chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus is saying, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Now, how do you know Jesus? How do you know Jesus? Because someone told you about Jesus. Maybe you were born in church. How do you know Jesus? If you liked gene genealogy, I love genealogy, by the way. And if you follow your roots, where they come from, at the end, all of our ancestors believe in Jesus Christ because of the message of the disciples. And today, we can believe in Jesus Christ because of the message of the disciple. So when Jesus Christ was praying, and he was saying, I'm not only praying for this disciple, but for all who will ever believe in me, that's you and me. That's you and me, and that's our kids and our grandkids and, and the generation to come. Jesus was thinking about all of us when he was praying. How does it make you feel to think that you and I were in Jesus' mind when he was praying to the Father, praying for that love? How does it, how does it make you feel that Jesus thought about you as his precious son, as his most beautiful daughter of him? How does that make you feel? This, isn't that awesome to feel the love of Christ for me? Me, angel? I was born in 1983, and Jesus prayed in the year 2000, uh, 2000 years ago, in the year one, perhaps, or before that. I don't know, but I know it's more than 2,000 years. Just to, to, to think that Jesus was thinking about me when he was praying, that's awesome. That's an awesome feeling. Jesus pray for you. Jesus' prayer for you and I was profound. It was not just a prayer. It was something really big. If we read verses 23, I'm talking about John chapter 17, verse 23 and verse 26. I want you to pay attention to this. Jesus asked the Father to love us. To love us in the same way that he loves him. Just think about that for a little bit. This is what the Bible says in the New Living Translation. Jesus is praying, verse 23, that the world will know that you sent me and that you, you love them as much as you love me. Even before Jesus asked the Father to love us, Jesus is saying, may the world know you. The world doesn't know you yet because we're, we're just revealing you to the world. But when the world knows you, may they know that you love the world, you love them, the people of the world, the same way that you love me. Now, do you think that God, the Father, loved Jesus? <laughs> How much love do you think God has for his son, Jesus Christ? But when you think about that, think of as if you were Jesus Christ. Not that you made that sacrifice. No, it was only Jesus that made that sacrifice. But when you think about the Father and the love that God has for you, think about you as Jesus Christ. That the Father looks at you the same way that he looks at Jesus Christ. But pastor, you don't know how many mistakes I have made in my life. And Jesus didn't make any mistake. He loves you the same way. Pastor, you don't know all the sins that I have committed in my whole life. I don't think that God will love me the same way that Jesus. The Bible says that he loves you the same way that he loves Jesus Christ. 
That's the Bible. That's Jesus who said it. Because God doesn't look at your mistakes. God doesn't look at the sin that you have made. He doesn't like the sins in our life. But God, that doesn't se uh, separate you from the love of God. Verse 26 says, I have revealed you to them. And I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them. And now that we have known the Father God, God's love for you is the same as Jesus because we are loved as Jesus. Now let me tell you this revelation. As I was preparing this sermon and reading the scripture, thinking profoundly in the word of Jesus Christ to, to me, let me tell you this revelation. We know that Jesus was 100% man. And we also know that Jesus is God. Right? Will you say amen with me? We know that Jesus is God. So when Jesus was ta talking to the Father in prayer, saying that may they know that your love for me is the same love for them. What Jesus is saying, that God loves you as much as he loves himself. Is that a little bit more profound? <laughs> that God loves you as much as he loves himself because Jesus is God. So when Jesus said, may the, know, may the world know that you love them as much as you love me, Jesus is saying, may they know that the love that you have for them is the same love that you have for yourself. Now, when you put that into perspective, you will understand the only two commandments that Jesus said are most important. To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second one is very similar. To love your neighbors as yourself. Why is that important? Because God loves you as he loves himself. And he will not ask you to do something that he will not do. That's not the character of God. And he asks us to love each other as we love ourselves. Because he loves you as he loves himself. That's how profound the love of God is for all of us. But the root cause of all our spiritual problem lies in not knowing the depth of his love. And that's where our spiritual problem comes from. All Christian believe theoretically in the loving Father that is in heaven. We all know that the sacrifice of Christ was great. And theoretically, because we can read in the scripture, we know that God loves us. But the fact that many are often worried and anxious and so full of insecurity and fears prove that they don't believe in the deep down in their heart the love that God has for you. This is why I say your sins will not separate you from God. Your mistakes, your failures will not separate you from God. He doesn't see you differently when you make mistakes. He doesn't love you differently when you make a, a, a sin against him. He loves you the same. He wants for you not to do it. And if we love God that way, we do everything in our power not to hurt God with sins. But if we do, he doesn't see you differently. And it is not, not until we understand the deepest of his love to understand God loves you as much as he loves Jesus Christ. God loves you as much as he loves himself. Can you, can you think about that for a second and let it sink in in your heart? God loves you as much as he loves himself. 
Now, is there anything, is there anything that can separate God from the love of himself? Is there anything that can separate God and his love apart? There's nothing that can set apart God and his own love for himself. And if you think about that, and he loves us as he loves himself, there's nothing that can separate you from his love. Many, many believers live under the false belief that tells them, you are not fasting enough. You're not praying enough. You're, you're, you're not witnessing enough. You're not fellowshipping enough with the, with the church. You're not doing enough for God. Why? Because throughout all our lives, we have people that have told us we are not enough. And naturally, in our lives, we don't want to disappoint people, right? That's naturally in our hearts and in our life. We don't want to disappoint people. And therefore, we try to do many things, not try to do enough things to make people happy. And when we come about God, and we don't pray as much as we were told, yeah, you have to pray for an hour every day in order for God to listen to you. No. Well, you have to fast at least two, two times a week before God will be able to do something about it in your life. No. That's not true. That's not true. And the believers, they are constantly believing in this false belief. They're constantly being whipped up by such thoughts into an endless round of activity into and into a multitude of works because when you feel that you're not enough when you feel that you, you're not doing enough for God you're trying to do many many things trying to fulfill that hole in your heart thinking that I have to do enough I have to do more I have to do more for God I have to do this and I, and I have to volunteer for this and and then you end up being really tired and not wanting to do anything else because you're too tired and it continues on and on because you feel that you're not enough for God. When God is telling you, you don't need to do anything to earn my love. Because I'm loving you the same way I love myself. Now, do you realize that your self-discipline, like fasting, praying, tithing, witnessing, fellowshipping, and things like that comes from our heart as gratitude to God for, what, who, for who He is and for the things that He has already done. When we fast to God, we don't fast to get God's attention. We fast to give Him glory. When we pray to God, we don't pray just for God to, to, to bring us all the blessings. And so we pray because we are grateful that we have what we need and that he's listening. When we tie to God the same way, when we do our works, we do our works as a, uh, as a grateful heart to God for the things that he has already done in our life and for who he is. And whether you do it or don't do it, those things change the fact that he loves you the same way he loves himself. God already loved you, loves us before we even knew these self-disciplines. Therefore, there is nothing we could ever possibly do to gain more of his love. This is the maximum expression of his love already was given to us on the cross. There's no more love than that. There's nothing greater than the love of God for himself to us. Nothing greater than that. Now let me give you this illustration. Two men stood at the sea shore and looked at the ocean. One said to the other, wow, look at all that water. Isn't that huge? Isn't that beautiful? The other one replied, yes, it is. And just to think, we are only seeing the top of it. 
from this point of view, we only see the top of it. There's nothing that we can see under that because we only see the top of it. The love of God is as vast, it's as, as big as that of this illustration. In our best effort, we can only see the surface of the love of God. It is higher than the highest mountain. It is deeper than the deepest sea and wider than the clearest sky. It is more profound than the highest thought of those most intelligent people on earth. We cannot explain it. But just to think that he loves us as much as he loved himself. And this is one final thought. What you do or don't do won't change the fact that you are loved as Jesus is loved. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, 17, and we just read this morning, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, again, we're one. Together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must share his suffering. If you're suffering this morning about any thoughts or anything in your life, it is not because God doesn't love you. If things are not going the way you think they should go or the way you thought it was going to go, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you or that God is not with you. Or that you failed God and now he left you. That is not the character of a loving father. That is not a character of a God that extends grace and his mercies are renewed every morning. That's not God. It is because we live in this sinful world. We live in this world that is full of sin. But in all and through all, remember this. You are loved as Jesus, even when we are sinful people. You are loved as Jesus. And if there's one thing that I want you to take home in this whole 15, 20 minutes of sermon, is that God loves you the way he loves himself. And I want you to, home, to go home with this thought. God loves you the same way he loves himself. And that is not a little love. That's a lot of love. So take that with you and think about that this week. And think about sharing the same love to those that surround us. And if someone failed you, offended you, or did something against you, Think about the same love that God has given you and share the same love and ask God what to do next with those feelings because you are loved as much as God loves himself. Let us pray. Father God, Many times we try to explain and understand the depth of your love. We try to do things in our lives to do enough for you and, and to gain that love. Many times we fail, God. And failure doesn't mean that you love us less. Failure is an opportunity for us to do it again one more time. And God, you love us. Your love for us is so great, so deep. I have experienced it. And God, I'm not perfect, and we're not perfect. This church is not perfect. But we should try to live a life that is 
pleasing to you, Lord. And thank you. I want to thank you, Father, for your revelation this morning. Lord, it is important for us to know how much we are loved by you. And to think that we are loved as much as you love yourself. It's a great thought, Father God. And I pray, Lord, that this word that we have heard from you, Father, may be treasured in our hearts and in the moment that we need this word, may you remind us of this amazing and beautiful love that you have for us. That you remind us that the mistakes that we made doesn't separate us from you. May you remind us, Lord, that the circumstances in our life that happened, it wasn't because you weren't loving us. May you remind us, Lord, that as long as we live in this sinful world, we're going to be hurt. Even you, Jesus said, in this world, you will suffer. But remember that I have conquered the world, and you are with us. So, Father, I pray that this word may help us in the moment that we need to be reminded of your love. God, I pray for our brothers and sisters that need healing and strength. Lord, I pray for my brother Stephen Jones, for Pastor Eduardo de la Cruz, for Nick. I pray, Lord, that you, your blessings be, be, be upon them and may they will receive healing and strength in Jesus' name. We also pray, Lord, for the Blakely family. This family, Lord, is grieving the loss of Ruth, a loved one. So we pray for strength for this family. May you help them to go through this difficult time knowing that you, God, knows what's best and knows us all and loves us all. I also pray for the people in Turkey and Syria, Lord, for these things that are happening, Lord, and the people that have lost a loved one there. So many lives, God, so many lives lost. We pray for healing. We pray, Lord, that everyone that is working, the rescue missions, the volunteers, the workers, the first responder, may you give them strength as they continue to finding more people. May you help this nation to heal, Lord, from those wounds, from these moments they don't know what to do, Father. Where to go, where to live. May your blessings be upon them in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, for our military family, especially for Nicholas and for all those, Lord, believers that are fighting in any of the military branch. May you protect them and bless them, bless their families. Bless their children. Bless their relationship. Father, and help them. Lord, give them strength. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
join me in the Lord's Prayer. Let us all pray together. Our Christ remind us that our treasures are gifts from God, are most beneficial when they are used for the kingdom of God. May these be the time when we bring forth our gifts to, blessed, to be blessed by God.
Vacations pave our path. May hopes comfort our world. And may love guide our lives. Go with patience, hope, and love. In the name of Jesus Christ, may all go in peace. Amen.